This week, I have the honor to interview Dr. Gabby Caffey from the Caffey Trading Company, Premium Cigars and Premium Coffee. Dr. Caffey is also the founder of the BCA, the Boutique Cigar Association. After his de departure from practice in medicine, Dr. Caffey wanted to bring the finest cigars handcrafted from Honduras to the market. Since 2013, he's been crafting 1901 cigars and a few other lines. We're going to talk about the history of the Honduras market when it comes to premium cigars. Stogie Geeks episode 322 starts right now. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. Joe and I are already silly. Oh yeah. yeah. Joe Hosempa, a.k.a. Joe Hollywood is here with me in studio. I'm fired up. And Cigars, perfected for more than 150 years. Yours to enjoy now. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Confidence. Confidence isn't walking into a room with your nose in the air, thinking you're better than anyone else. It's walking into a room and not having to compare yourself to anyone in the first place. Welcome everyone to episode 322 of Stogie Geeks. I am your host, Joe Hozempa. And today I have the privilege and the honor to finally catch up with Dr. Gabby Caffey. It's been all my fault. I apologize. Joe. Dr. Caffey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, man. <laughs> I, I'm so uh, excited to be here. Yes. Listen, I took I took the afternoon off. Oh, I did. Good, good for you. I, I, I should take the afternoon off. We've had a crazy morning here, uh, both in the office and out of the office and phone calls and all this stuff and... And uh, it's 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 anything can happen Friday here at the Security Weekly Studios or the Joe Zempa household back home. You know anything can happen Friday, so you know it's uh, it's crazy. My, I, 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 agree. I got, I, agree. I, got so I gotta much... tell you, I'm a bit jealous, Joe. <laughs> I got so much going on. I got well, I I have an 18 month old son, so that's a roller coaster ride. My brother is probably 31 days out away from having his first child. Uh, their first child. He's 10 years younger than I am. You know, every day he's like, man, it's getting like I'm on my way to work. And thank God I have a 45 commute, yeah. uh, a 45 minute commute each way to work because it gives me time to talk people off yeah. the bridge and solve the world's problems for an hour Incredible. and a half a day. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. And, and, and then I have a chance to, to catch up with you. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, you, you've, you've been on my radar for a, 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 a while now. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's just been pretty crazy, but, uh, uh, let's talk about when, when I had finally caught up with you, you, you wanted to talk about Honduras and you wanted I to, did. and, and you wanted to have a spotlight on Honduras and you know something we mention it here on the show. Oh yeah, it's Nicaraguan and Honduran, and, yeah. and, and 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 so much because of the um, small batch or boutique uh, yeah. re revolution that I dub it as. Nicaragua gets in that highlight, and I am so happy that you are here to shine a spotlight on history, culture, economics uh -huh. of the Honduran market, and please educate us about that section of the world. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I, I special thanks goes out to uh, my dear friend Armin, 
if it weren't for him, you and I would not have uh, been able to connect with each other. So thanks a lot, man. I love uh, Stogie Geeks. Been a huge supporter. You guys have been around forever. Yes. Um, yeah. Are you guys, uh, Joe? Is there? I, I'm I'm looking at myself. It's kind of weird. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Is That's this okay. the? Uh, maybe it's the way. There we go. I don't know how that happened. Well, Beautiful. Yeah, I'm on the other end. I can see you in the Stoy Geeks okay. listener. You and I have a split screen. When you go off into discussion, Beautiful. it's going to go to you and vice versa. I feel like a nut job talking to myself on the screen. <laughs> but, <laughs> I do it all the time, even if I'm off Stogie Geek. That's great. So. <laughs> but, but you know what? Honduras is like the stepchild of the cigar industry. That's the way I see it. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's like, you know, it's like uh, you're born in a home with two kids. Older brother gets all the attention. Mm. And and Hondur- uh, Nicaragua became the older brother to the cigar industry. Multiple factors, right? Yes. Um, historically, right? Let, let's go back to... Uh, so you guys get an understanding where my opinions come from, right? My grandfather landed in La Union, El Salvador, in 1901. It's a small fishing village on the Pacific coast of El Salvador uh, that was, at the time, it had a small port, and it was receiving a lot of ships from New York. Uh, people that were traveling from England to Ellis Island and then were making their way south. Uh, they were actually arriving in Puerto Cortes on the Atlantic side, but they were making their way to La Unión, El Salvador, because that's where a lot of them were congregating. Mm -hmm. For about 25 years, my grandpa lived in El Salvador, from 1901 to about 1925, 1926. Um, Being there, he got married, had multiple kids, ended up having 11 kids. In the mid-30s, he relocated to Honduras. He felt there was better opportunity there. So we've been in Honduras since. I'm third generation Honduran. I was born, raised there. I speak, I'm bilingual. I speak Spanish better than my English. And it's kind of interesting that we come from a family that's got nearly 50 first cousins. Hmm. 11 aunts and uncles, 50 first cousins. You can imagine the second cousins literally, I can't even count them. Hmm. And having been in Honduras for so many years and seeing the shifts, political shifts, economic shifts, you know, the migration of people, not only out of Honduras, but into Honduras, you know, Honduras, most people don't know this, but Honduras is a country that today has about 300,000 Christian Palestinian families, people living there. It's, it's the one country in all of Central America that has received more Christians from that part of the world than any other. I think second is Chile, third is Argentina, then Colombia. But it's, it's, it became a, a, a real melting pot. For many, many years, we thought of the U.S. as a melting pot. But even before the U.S., I think the, the melting pot in the U.S. began to happen in the past 30 years. I'd say in the past 100 years. Honduras has become a melting pot. And um, so our family's been in Honduras for nearly a century. And during that time, we've seen uh, the family go from, let's say, the cotton industry to coffee to tobacco to different regions of, of you know, they're, they're businessmen. My grandfather was a textiles merchant. And he traveled to Central America looking for places where he could grow grow cotton, produce thread, and sell thread to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And 100 years later, where do we find ourselves? The third generation um, has really expanded. We've got doctors, lawyers. We've got architects. We've got everything you can think of. We've got... I've got cousins that own furniture companies. Uh, every single individual in our family took a path. I took the path of tobacco. That's my path. That's what I love. That's what I connect with. That's what I want to do the rest of my life is mm-hmm. premium cigars and tobacco. Now, if we look at Honduras, it's the year 2020. What are the... St- current state of affairs in Honduras as a country, honestly, not very good. Um, But as bad as they are, I think we're reaching a climax because 
Not once in the past 30 years has there been an absence of a U.S. presence in Honduras. So we have the largest U.S. military base in Honduras called Palmero La Base. It's, it's full of Marines, 20,000 Marines last time I checked. We've got right now one of the largest U.S. embassies in Honduras with a, a specific, we have State Department offices in Honduras. We've got the DEA in Honduras, three different locations uh, on the north coast. We've got uh, Roatan, uh, I think it's Utila, and then you've got uh, the Triangle where San Pedro Sula is. And I'm mentioning these names so you start becoming familiar. If you ever hear somebody went to San Pedro, you know where they were at. Now, it's, you're probably sitting there wondering, why the hell are there so many Americans down there? <laughs> well, we became the pit stop for Colombia. Mm. And a lot of people in the industry don't want to talk about this. I, my theory is, unless we talk about it, we're not going to fix it. I, I agree with that when it comes industry-wise as well. Everybody doesn't want to talk about PCA, the boutiques, the, the, the FDA, the legislation that got passed through the House. And nobody wants to talk about it. Everybody, everybody kind of outskirts around it or, or sends me emails saying, you know, you talk a lot about stuff on Story Geeks, but you don't quite understand, like, the, the decision-making process. No, I do. My first professional job was the United States uh, Senate. I worked mm -hmm. for a U.S. senator here. That's, so that's my first professional job. Um, realized that I needed to take 15 showers a day. I knew that politics wasn't for me. <laughs> uh, good news is I realized that at uh, 21 years old, right? So, wow. you know, so it, you know and, and so I understand how things are made with checks and balances and all of that type of stuff. But nobody wants to talk about those, those real issues. Right. You, you bring up a good point. Here is a country that is the, um, that is the uh, incubator for Colombian activity between the U.S. and Colombia, yet it's trying to go through its own economic cycle, its own business right. cycle, create its own identity, how this relates to premium cigars, right? We all talk about all the boutiques and all the brand new stuff, and all the brand new stuff is from Nicaragua. I'm guilty yeah. of it. I'm a stick chaser as well. You know, I go out there and try to get that, and then, you know, and it's amazing how even we say, oh, well, you know, it's got a Honduran Nicaraguan blend. But let me tell you about the spice. Yeah. It, it, so as soon as you go spice or pepper or or medium full, you know we're going to talk about Nicaragua as opposed yeah, to Honduran. Yeah. So it's like kind of dragging it. I, right. I want you to, 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 to spend some time and talk about that colombian stop i think it needs to be heard yeah, yeah but 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 then i also would love to hear how the how the premium cigar culture is uh there and you also ha uh obviously have experience in the coffee culture because uh yes, yes. cafe distributors does do both so yeah yeah we do both yeah so i, I listen my 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 visit today this interview is not about colombia or the, <laughs> you know netflix's narco series right you can watch that we can but make I'll, it controversial you, if you want. I'll, I'll go that way and do a two-part series with you if you want to. You know? But I'll tell you, I, I will say this, man. I'm watching Narcos. That mm. shit's pretty accurate. Oh, right? for sure. So, yeah. So it, instead of listening to me, just watch the show and everything they basically say kind of happened. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. Honduras is cleaning up its act. The U.S. State Department right now is investing in building a brand-new U.S. embassy in the capital city of Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And that the, the function of that U.S. Embassy is to bring stability to the region, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, the whole region. So I'm, I'm excited that being from Honduras, you know, we get to host the location of the greatest U.S. Embassy in the whole region. Mm. So I, I think the next five or 10 years, 20 years for Honduras is going to be extremely positive. Now, on that note, let's shift over to tobacco. Okay. Honduras isn't known for producing, you know, kick your teeth in tobacco. You know, the strong, the spicy, mm -hmm. the, the, um, there are areas of Honduras, uh, like Copan and Hamastran that I think a lot of people have heard about. There's a certain tobacco that's also very popular. It's from the Trojes region, Trojes. And it does, it, it does have a little bit more full body. But what, what Honduras tobacco brings to the cigar industry 
is balance and body. No question. Period. Yep. You know, if, 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 if you want, like when I think of the Dominican Republic, I think of those light shade wrappers. I think of the Piloto Cubano fillers. I think of that, you know, sharp, I call it a Fuerte Fino retrohale, sharp and strong, yep. soft retrohale. Honduras brings in body balance. Nicaragua brings in the punch. Yep. Now, that's the beauty of everything we produce at our factory incorporates tobacco from each country. We don't have a Honduran puro. It doesn't exist for us. We could make it, but we never really have. I think they're too linear. I don't think there's much complexity there. Now, I will tell you this, that the factories that are in Honduras, there's only 16 left, Joe. Mm. There's 174 factories in Nicaragua right now. There's 16 left in Honduras. There used to be 68 in Honduras. They all left to Nicaragua for many, many, many reasons. Right. Stop right there. Can you just give yeah. me a quick time frame on that? You know, was it 20 years it's going down? So it's been for it's 68, it's 68, year, uh, 68 it, years, 68 factories. Now it's down to 14, you said, or 16? I would say the timeline is about... And I'm, I'm using an article that Cigar Aficionado did mm -hmm. where they had Honduras on the cover and they had the title was Honduras, the Mecca of Tobacco. Mm. That was back when Padron was in Honduras, Jose Padron. Yep. You know, and a lot of people were in Honduras, but there's, you know, people don't realize it's it's an hour drive, guys. It's not like, we're, you know, it's like the moon and the earth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So to get um, through Honduras is an hour drive, right? Uh, it's similar to the state of Rhode Island, no traffic, right? So it's pretty small. Correct. It's pretty small uh, there. Um, it, it is a gateway, as as you said, um, for sure, uh, between Colombia and the U.S. But why have some of these factories closed other than political climate? Has it been the demand for the product or are they really shipping it out of Honduras to the Nicaraguan factory to produce the premium tobacco right. because it's a little bit more efficient because obviously when you start talking economies of scale or the production of a factory, Nicaragua that would have more would logically tell me from a business and economic standpoint it has more manpower, right? It's just a bigger so factory. Let's go back uh, to 1958. Uh, I was not these around. These are stories that aren't really told, but uh, I'll, I'll talk to. I won't give names, but I'll go into some detail. Sure. Honduras is one of the largest exporters of coffee in all of Central America, right? Mm -hmm. Just just to give you an idea of the coffee business in Honduras, um, last year 80 million cigars, premium cigars, came to the U.S. Right. Yes. That's that's roughly, let's say if you could squeeze a million cigars in a 40-foot container, that's 80 containers of premium cigars. Yep. You can only fit, like, what, 500,000 cigars? It's 500,000. Yeah, 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 right. Gotcha. For, yeah, 450, four, four whatever. But I'm, I'm using the number 1 million so you can figure 80 containers, 80 million, you know, it's pretty easy, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the coffee industry exported 18,000 40-foot containers last year. Wow. So, so when, when people talk about the FDA and regulations, and then the first thing that comes to head, my head is, are we really that relevant? We're not relevant. No. We're small. We're, we're like, we're hobbyists is what we are. Yes, absolutely. And you actually bring up a good point, especially when it comes to the FDA or boutiques or any pending legis legislation, right? Only 2%. I think it's just a scotch below 2% of the U.S. population smokes premium tobacco. Or premium cigars. Yeah, That's and on a, average, once a month. And, and on, right, because they go <laughs> and, and they celebrate. I mean, we, we are not, we are a, an extremely rare breed. The ones that, you know, I have a backpack, I travel with my cigars, I go out, right, I enjoy. Right. There isn't a day that goes by where I at least have one and, and, and just take the time out to go. Some, obviously, I have multiple we do taste testing here and all that stuff here at Story Geeks and, and Sticks of the Week. Right. So, right. so, so we're a rare breed, breed, but if you think about that, less than 2% of the U.S. population smokes premium tobacco, okay? Um, 
and and like you said, it's once or twice a month from from there. You know, getting together with some friends yeah. or golfing or whatever your social fishing, whatever your social activity is, and then that's that. So what I don't get, and I started talking about this with uh, Armin last episode on Stogie Geeks three twenty one, where I think it started out as a potential, I don't want to say money grab, but a potential, let us look into this market when it comes to the FDA. Right. Right. And the way that the premium cigar <clears throat> handled it, here comes all the bad emails, right? Came from me first. Everyone else freaking loves the FDA, right? Uh, the way that it was handled, the industry just totally freaked out, I believe, over <laughs> nothing. And I've been saying this on record from Cigar Club Radio all the way through Story Geeks, they've been freaking out over nothing. For what? For for a, a couple of potential... Th- what's going to happen is if your cigar is really awesome, yeah, the, one of the big guys is going to pick you up. I mean, it works that way in any industry, right? If you're a great landscaper, okay, who cuts the... It does everything right and whatnot. Yeah. But this landscaping company has a fleet of them. He would hire you, sure. and and I mean it, it, it's business, so yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. which level, you know. But so I'm imagining that these factories shut down not only because of government and stuff like that. Probably the work is migrated over to coffee because that's where the money was for them. Clearly, well, see, we I want to I want to get back on track because we, we we're talking about so many exciting things. Oh, here you're that... on the wrong show if you want to stay on track. Uh, you're, <laughs> and you're talking to the wrong host. That's for focus, sure. Focus. Focus. <laughs> I'll try. No, I'll try. I'm I'm the one that needs to focus. Okay. I'm having some of our coffee right now, by the way. There you go. I'm having a Bloody Mary, by the way. But uh. <laughs> so, but. The coffee didn't happen overnight. We've been, we've been in the coffee business as a family since 1937. Mm-hmm. And my wife's family's been doing it even longer. Wow. They, 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 her family owns Cafe Maya and Cafe El Indio, which are the two biggest brands in all of Honduras. Mm. There's nine and a half million people drinking her her family's, her aunt's, her uncle's coffee, you know? Cool. You guys hiring? <laughs> I just got fired. You want to do? Ask her if she wants to do a coffee podcast. We 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 can make that happen. You know what? I I, I will I will do that, man. She'll probably say no, but I'm gonna ask her. You you can be the host because it's your wife, and I'll be the co-host. You know what? We're so low key. We're so out of the. You know, we don't. <laughs> I love doing this because it's you, Joe. Mm. And there's a lot of guys out there like Will Cooper and all these guys sure. that I love. Yeah, but. Yeah. But, you know, when, when we look at the shift of tobacco from Honduras to Nicaragua, there were several reasons. Number one was um, salaries. Over the past 20 years, salaries have more than doubled in Honduras. And I, you'll get a lot of guys attacking me for saying this. But, I, I mean, just look it up. Just Google it. Look up the salaries, minimum wage of Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and Honduras. And you're going to find that Honduras is double of every other cigar producing country except Costa Rica and Panama. You know, we're, we're at about minimum wage, about $300 a month, 323 right now. Mm-hmm. While, you know, the DR and Nicaragua are at 130, 135. Now, I'm not saying that that's what these factories are paying their staff. I'm saying that's what the government has established as a minimum wage. Yep. The second thing, labor laws in Honduras have made it now so that we have to pay 14 months. If we hire somebody for 12 months, we have to pay an extra month for retirement and an extra month for a Christmas bonus. Oh, wow. So not only do we have double the salary that we're paying, but we're paying 14 months. We do it. You know, it's not easy. We do it. And people say, oh, why aren't you going to the trade show this year? Well, because we just paid out a bunch of salaries. That we, you know. <laughs> but right. sorry about the beep. I don't even know how to stop that. That's okay. Um, that's the second thing. The third thing is that The banks in Honduras, the interest rates are crazy through the roof. You know, the currency of Honduras is the Lempira. The Lempira is right now about 25 to 1. 25 Lempiras for a dollar. Mm -hmm. So when you borrow money in Honduras, you're borrowing money in Lempiras. And the interest rates are between 24 to 32%. (laughs) There's no possible way you can walk into a bank, take out a loan at 30%. No. And here's here's the catch though is if you if you're late 30 days or 60 days they they add 5 or 10% on top of that. Yeah, compounds, sure. Yeah. So it's impossible. Now, Nicaragua is 
In the past 20 years, because of Nicaragua's relationship with Venezuela, Venezuela has been using Nicaragua to funnel all their cash to, from the Petro Caribe Act. The, the, basically, I don't know if you, you've heard of the, uh, uh, what, what are these group of countries called? ALBA? Okay. The ALBA countries all in right. Central America and South America. When the U.S. signed a free trade agreement with Mexico, and a few other countries to mm -hmm. do free trade and no import or export taxes. Um, Cuba protested, Venezuela protested, Nicaragua protested, and because they lean hard to the left, they form their own association called ALBA. So they have a free trade agreement between them. So what Venezuela did, since it was such a massive petroleum producer, it would export petrol and Nicaragua would send food. Because if you look at Venezuela as a country, they don't grow anything. All they do is export petroleum. Right. So over the years, what's happened is Nicaragua's been, has had very strong banks like Bach Bank, BAC. Most people don't know Bach Bank about 15 years ago was bought out by General Electric. Bach Bank used to be owned by Carlos Pelas, the owner of Flor de Caña Rum. So these banks grew a lot. They got bought out by General Electric. There's been a lot of movement. But the important thing is, and what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of liquidity in Nicaragua. And the interest rates are much lower. And the third factor, which caused everybody to migrate over, is the cost of land was dirt cheap compared to Honduras. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is because in the 70s, when the Sandinistas took over, it was a known fact that if... The government of Nicaragua decided to put a bus stop on that corner. They would take your land. Okay, yeah. So, so no, nobody wanted to invest in Nicaragua. So the price per acre was in the gutter. Right. And and guess what? The 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 cigar manufacturers, they were buying up a thousand acres, two thousand acres because they figured if they lost fifty acres, who cares? We still have eighteen hundred acres. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the it's a three. Three different factors. Salaries, number one, the ease of lending, number two, and the cost of actually setting up a factory. So all that, of this combined set up <clears throat> the how it reflects to the premium cigars, the Nicaraguan boom that we're, we're, exactly, we're, all, that exactly. we're all consuming um, there. That's all. That, that's crazy. That's so. But no, so look, what's the I future mean, look like? Well, well what's the I'm, future of Honduras look like outside of coffee? Because it sounds like if you and I wanted to go into business, we'd go into coffee over premium cigars over there. There'd be better opportunity. We'd probably get financed more because we can capture more market share. <laughs> but look, b before we go there, I do want to say this because uh, the tobacco in, in Nicaragua, and I want to give credit to the farmers in Nicaragua. Because mm, they had you to know, adapt for sure. They, they not only had to adapt, but they found themselves in virgin country, virgin soil full of nutrients. And right now, our factory would cease operating if we couldn't get tobacco from Nicaragua. Wow. You know, we use Habano wrapper from Nicaragua. We're getting San Andres. We're, right now, we're getting Connecticut broadleaf wrapper from Nicaragua. Who the hell would have thought we're getting Connecticut broadleaf wrapper from Nicaragua, you know? Mm -hmm. And let's not even talk about the fillers. My favorite filler of all time is Ligero from Jalapa Valley, period. Mm-hmm. Like, if you want to know the secret to my blends, I just told you. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll go there. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, but there, there are, look, if you want to talk about businesses in Honduras, Honduras became famous, and it is famous now, for maquilas, which are assembly plants for apparel companies. Right now, Nike is building the largest apparel factory in all of Central America in Honduras. You can look this up. It's amazing. And what's happening is the, the construction of the U.S. Embassy is giving international investors a lot of confidence to invest in the country. It's become a lot safer. We've had a lot of problems. I'm not going to say where, you know, you can walk down the street at midnight and everything will be fine. Sure. But but like any third world country, you have to be safe. you got to take precautions. I think Honduras and Nicaragua, my wife is half Nicaraguan, so, you know, I, I, I empathize with the fact that her family had to flee Nicaragua because of the Sandinistas. 
And it, it's it's a very interesting scenario. My wife's uh, mother is related to. She's first cousins with uh, Juan, you know, um, Alejandro Martinez from Hoya de Nicaragua. Mm. This is, yeah, this is my wife's side of the family. No kidding. So I, I kind of know what's going on there, and there's a lot of battles. Um, in the short term, I see a lot of, let's, the word is nebulous, cloudy, cloudiness. Yep. But I think in the next five to ten years, um, and we won't get into politics, but I firmly believe Trump's second term, if he does win, mm -hmm. he's going to shift his attention to Central and South America. Mm -hmm. Because he's 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 got this, uh, can we use adult words? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got a hard on yeah, for yeah. Er eradicating socialism everywhere it exists. Well, from he, he North does. North Korea yeah. to China to Russia. And um, and and if I could, you you made a good point. If you could just pause that point for a second, especially when it comes to politics, especially when it comes to this uh, FDA par portion or this latest bill that that passed through the House, Trump. Whether you <clears> like <throat> him, love him, or leave him, I'm not really. I don't really talk politics, sex, religion, or Yankees, Red Sox, baseball. Those are my things, especially when I'm in the cigar shop, right? You know, you do what you want to do. You know what I mean? But Trump is is not going to do something that's going to hurt business, small brick yeah. and mortar business and whatnot, especially towards the end of the first term going into the second term. Now, unfortunately, I think that they'll kick the can into his second term, right? And we'll, it will, I mean, what the hell? We've been kicking it since 2014. Yeah. What, 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 that was another year, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, we've been kicking the whole FDA thing for sure. Uh, I'm getting kind of tired of talking about it, but, you know, uh, it's very important that, you know, and, and, and he really does, like, want to try to, he, he wants to be a, uh, he wants to put his name in the history books. I think he potentially could be going about his discourse and demeanor be handled a little bit better, but he's a maverick. And what shocks so let, let me let me but let what me shocks say this me because but, but what shocks me is everyone says mm -hmm. well he's a maverick. He was a maverick before he was president. Are we yeah. shocked? I mean, you know <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. If, I, if you travel <laughs> through Nicaragua, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just I want you and your audience to go back and look at Daniel Ortega's parade, right, from last year. Mm -hmm. He had a military parade. In Nicaragua, Central Square. And I want you to look at all the military gear donated to Nicaragua from Russia. The tanks, the freaking Hummers. You, I mean, <clears throat> you name it. It's like their entire military, um, the guns that the police use, everything was donated from Russia. That's just one component. Second component, as you're driving through Nicaragua and you're going over a pier, <clears throat> not a pier, a bridge. You'll freaking see a sign saying donated by China. <laughs> so what happens is the, the socialism that exists in, in the Western Hemisphere mm -hmm. is, is being fed by Russia, China, North Korea, and these countries that do – look at China and Cuba. They do business fantastic together. Practically all Cuban cigar boxes come from China. Yep. I mean, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not stating an opinion. It's a fact. Oh, yeah, for sure. For you know? sure. And, and, and so the thing is that I think we're going to see a shift in the next five to ten years. If if this you know president does get a second term, I think it's going to make things really interesting. And I see I see themselves positioning um, to really take control over Central America in the next five to ten years with this embassy that they're building. It's massive. It's the biggest embassy I've ever seen. I mean, it's that big. It's I think it's it's on a property that's nearly fifty acres, right? Because they're 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 putting headquarters for the U.S. State Department there, right? And and for for the U.S. to have such a strong presence there, it's great for the region. It's going to bring stability to the region. Yeah, it usually means if they're going to invest in in that, just like you said in Nicaragua, you know, bridge donated by China, etc. If they're coming in, if, if, if the bigger country is coming in and helping them with infrastructure, make things a little easier for them. You know, it's similar. It's similar to you embracing a friend who might be down on his or yeah. her luck, who might be down on his or her luck, and you help them out. You know what I mean? Because, you, you, you know, you, you got, they, they're interested in the geographical position of the property, 
but they're also interested in the ability to negotiate to U.S. businesses outside of the cigar, the premium right, cigar right. industry to say, hey, you might want to move this plant over here instead of overseas right. to China because we can Genius, give you yeah. one, two, three, A, B, C, and then move on there. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean it's, it's, it's right in their backyard. Yeah. It's so easy. It's, we it's should here do a podcast days. on this, you and me. We could talk for days on this stuff. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Watch us go into business together. <laughs> you know, we. I mean, seriously, it's like it's like seriously, like yeah. th- this is like you know, it reminds me of a game we used to play when I was little. I was little, yeah. little. I used to play with with my grandparents. Um, the heck was a, it was Stratego. Stratego is a board game. And, yeah. you know, you had all the different countries and, and all the different <laughs> things. And, you, you know, you rolled the dice, which gave you the uh, – the ability for you to move wherever you move, but yeah, that's yeah. similar to to putting it I in think parliament. It's beautiful. That's similar yeah. to putting it in parliament. You only got one of six choices anyway on the die, right? So, so, so you got one of six choices of what can happen from parliament. It's it's a really good game. Listen, you know, you know my my grandfather <laughs> used to say, "I don't see problems, I see opportunities." Oh, for sure. Yeah, and that's the that's the way we've seen it. Look, our entire family. If if you if you break us down, right, like. A lot of people ask me if I have any business partners. I don't. This is me, myself, and I. And yeah. I have a, my right-hand man in Honduras, Oscar Ferreira, who I brought on board. And him and I had a talk. We had a heart-to-heart because people are like, how can you have a factory if you don't live in Honduras? You're in Miami most of the time. How does it work? Well, my kids are young. They're, they're 8 and 11 years old. Mm-hmm. And, and his kids are also young. And him and I really get along very well. We... We built a strong relationship, and him and I had a heart-to-heart one day, and I said, look, man, I go, we got two options. Either we wait 20 years for our kids to grow up, and then we can really start to grow the business the way it should be organically, infrastructure, because we have a box factory, a cigar factory. We produce our own cellophane. We're kind of all in one. Mm -hmm. I said, or we could just literally form a bond where we strengthen Honduras, we strengthen operations in Miami and we really grow this business because there's room for everybody. That's the way I see it. You know, I, I, I didn't get into this business for the money. I mean, if you go into this business for the money, you're crazy because there's a joke that if you want to make a million dollars in the cigar business, you show up at the factory with five million, you know, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, <'cause, laughs> I, mean, I get that. Yeah, for sure. Because we 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 hear that a lot whenever we interview. Yeah, some some but, there. And but you know we all have an idea. You get into the business because um, you know according to your bio, you were into premium cigars at the age of eighteen. You mm-hmm. you you like the opportunity there. We we the stories are very very similar. And you're right. There is room for more um, there, and it is a different product. Uh, it is a different um, demographic when it comes to the product. There should be yeah. a different culture when you walk into a brick and mortar and all of that stuff. There's been a big economic shift of bars you can smoke in with all these smoking laws across right. the country, you know, and stuff like that. And then there's been a shift in culture um, there, um, you know, and, and but there is room for everyone. There really is. And not for nothing, you being... You're the founder of the Boutique Cigar Association, right? Right. right. So, so how, how this spits into there? Any one of your um, your members who For join brands, right? yeah. Br- brands that joins. Well, there's members too because you can get into it as a media and all of that stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. but you know, the it, the bottom line is you got to protect your brand and innovate your brand. It doesn't matter right. which cigar company. There, there, there is room for a lot of people, and a lot of them, you know. Sometimes, you know, it, it's not easy to to do that, you know, especially with all the different indicators that are happening now. Social media influence, influences, no brand ambassadors as right. strong as there coming up with you know different laws of passing out cigars and getting your product out. But you know something, as a business owner, you have to adapt and shift. You know? So people often ask, what well, what was the motive behind the BCA, right? Mm. And everyone's like, oh, you know, they're, they're always – and I guess this is because of uh, maybe what other people have done in the past. Uh, it's a grab for attention. It's, oh, me, me, me. It's it, And so when the Boutique Cigar Association happened, me being a doctor, right, and I, I'm a person that reads a lot. 
the first thing I started doing when when the FDA published that 480 page manual about regulations on the premium cigar industry, I I, I sat down and I read the whole thing, mm-hmm. and I I wanted to understand what we're dealing with. And I think of all the small brands, you know, because there's boutique has been kind of like hoard out the name. I mean, you've got companies making 100,000 cigars a day saying they're boutique and. It's kind of taken value away from the family-owned companies that are really eating shit and living their passion, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the BCA was established because my phone started ringing off the hook from other brand owners. Hey, Gabby, what's going on? You know, for some reason, they always called me to find out what's going on because I, I tend to stay up to date with everything. And thank God I, I have good legal counsel that kind of I work with and they feed me information and then we go and... But I, I didn't feel that it was fair to 30, 40, 50 companies that have joined since that they I was referring them to lawyers that I was working with and the lawyers were turning them down. They weren't taking on new clients. Mm. They were too busy. They had enough they have enough of a workload. I'm serious. So when I started getting calls back saying, Hey Gabby, you know what? They they're not taking any more new clients. I saw a real problem, and and what we did, me and six other guys decided to put together the Boutique Cigar Association. We put together a board of directors, and we took a lawyer out of Hawaii, Mm -hmm. retailers, brand owners. um, I think we even had uh, sales reps as part of the original group. And our our focus was to get through the first three humps, which was number one was the uh, registering with the FDA, number two was doing the warning and labeling advertising plan, which they've thrown out since. Yep. And and the third was getting us ready to submit ingredients, which every brand that's a member of the BCA is up to date with all those standards. And what's great is that once you've passed those three phases, the FDA gives you an STN number, which is a tracking number proving that you have filed and you're compliant and you've registered with the FDA. So what that does is when we're approaching retailers to carry our products, well, the larger retailers want some kind of proof that you're in the game for the long run. So we, we were able to get everybody kind of up to date and on par and get their STN numbers so that if a retailer asks them for that information, we're being compliant and they can carry our products. So it was a way to kind of save a lot of small boutiques to stay in business. Now, because implementation of the regulations hasn't really gone into place yet, I don't know if it will. I honestly don't know if it will go, if they'll implement the regulations. There's been a lot of guys that have just been running their business like it's the Wild West, you know, introducing new brands, not registering them, you know, producing a thousand boxes and blowing through them and then never bringing it back. Short runs, limited runs. Yep. I can't say what they're doing, if it's registered or not, but from what I see, the behavioral patterns in the industry, mm-hmm. there's still a lot of guys that are introducing stuff that I don't think is even you know, the thought of the FDA is nowhere near because everything's usually pre-sold even before it lands. Right. Right. You know, but where this takes us is for me, I wanted to preserve and kind of uh, maintain the legacy that Honduras had with tobacco years back. Number two, I did want to kind of highlight boutique brands and keep them at the forefront. And uh, we seem to have done that, but also in doing that, I think we've pissed off a couple people because we really did define the word boutique. Yeah, that well, that was needed, right? I think I think coming up with the definition, an official definition of a criteria that fits boutique, was needed. It's the same thing. It's the same argument that I've always made on the other side of the FDA coming up with a full definition. That defines premium tobacco or premium cigar association, premium, pre, blah, 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 what is the definition of a premium cigar? All that need, needed to be defined, you know? You know, what, what inspired me personally to define boutique was the definition that the FDA had for small business, a company that generates $5 million or less per year. Mm-hmm. And in, in our world of boutique cigars, I think the proper definition should be more close to a million dollars or less a year. Mm-hmm. You know, so there, there's a big gap. I think in in the premium cigar industry, medium-sized companies are in the two to five million. Yep. 
the large companies are, I think, seven and above or five and above. But there's there's a I think eighty percent of our industry, if you look at companies, not revenue. Yep. Eighty percent of our brands are owned by companies that generate a million or less a year. Right. You know, and and we were kind of getting lost in the crowd because if you look at the Newman factory, Fuente, you look at Rocky Patel, Padron, Oliva, they've got such strong voices because of the money behind, you know, every time they speak, you know, they're writing a check. And I take, trust me, I'm extremely grateful for that. But also our, our message gets lost. We're like, you know, hey, doesn't anybody want to hear my opinion? Right. And that's where the BCA came in. And I'll tell you what, Cigar Rights of America has been 100%. We've been in alliance with them. We've been working with them, traveling with them, getting the, the word out. Because the first guys to disappear are going to be us. See, you think that. You you think that. And, and, and I think that there's going – it's not going to be an immediate decision. There's going to be a rollout process. And I think that the boutiques or the ones that are producing under a million who produce superior products that the ones that are bigger, the companies, the brands that are bigger, more corporatized, you, yeah. you think that. But, like, I mean, you know, yeah. I, I, you, I mean, look, I, I think we're going to see a lot happening like what happened to Drew Estate. Here comes all the hate email. I can see it already, right? As soon as I say that word, right? Like Drew Estate. Like, like if, you're, if you're a boutique and you produce something, I mean, they started yeah. out as boutique, whether we all want to admit it or not. The, and, yeah. and they've built one hell of, an, of, of a consumer army loyalty rank and file system program, right? That, that's off to them, right? They've they've done a phenomenal job, right? And there are some sticks that I really, really like from them, and there are some that are really not part of my palette there. That doesn't matter. They started out there. And I honestly think that if the FDA were to roll down and go through a stake that, that, that looks like it's going to phase out a lot of those under-million-dollar businesses, I think the ones that stand out, um, <clears throat> they're going to get a phone call. And what do you think? Yeah. You want you want I, I because economics yeah. tells me that, like like. But you know, I, I, you 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 know. Uh, you can I'm tell me big... I'm wrong. Everybody does. Everybody I talk to at your level tells me I'm I'm off my rocker. Right? I think you're not because there's living <laughs> proof of it. And the first example of that is Rafael Nadal with Boutique Blends. Yep. Sure. The, you, I mean, you're you're you're, you're speaking facts, and yep. if, if if companies. Like theirs, you know, with uh, I think his uh, partner's Hank Bishop. It's funny, right? I did my residency uh, in foot and ankle surgery where they used to work. So we, we kind of all came out of the same hospital, you know? Uh, but the beauty of it is that Rafael Nodal really took his business to the max in the boutique world. Mm -hmm. and, and he's a fantastic blender. And nobody can take credit away from the man. He, he works harder than anybody else in this industry that I've seen this the past three to five years. I Look, I'm not taking credit away from other people, but what I'm saying is you're 100% right. If you have your shit together and your brands are, are, are you know, Moving. creating intrigue and attention yeah. and demand, they'll absorb you. Now, he didn't sell his company. They're distributing his products, but I don't know what type of relationship they've established. But I think he found himself a home with Altidus, and I think congratulations to him. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like you know, it's it's. I just basic economics tells me that it's going to go that way. Now there are going to be some that do fall off the map for sure, and if they're pre predicate date or not, right, then right. they would have to adapt and then make a decision. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, collaboration. Uh, if that's the case, right. you know, joining forces there. Um, unfortunately for us consumers, not business owners, but for the Stogie Geeks or the Stogie Geeks listener and, and their creativity is going to go way down for a couple of years. Right. Because there's going to creativity of blends. Yeah. Right. Cre so, you know, it's going to be like it's going to be we you know, for those of you who stick chase like me and I walk into a humidor, I want to know what's selling and what's new. 
right? Right. Uh, what's new? You know, what's new? What's new? What's new? What's new? We we all do it, right? Uh, especially if we go to a car lot or an, you know, again, switch 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 any industry, right? So you know, when 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 you get down there and and you find out what's new, I think that maybe for three to five years, maybe three to ten years, that creativity factor is going to go way down. Businesses are going to have to adjust. The really great ones are going to get scooped up in there, or you're, yeah. you're going to sell out the rest of your inventory. Uh, it'll go to another yeah. factory as some of their re-releases or a yeah. special blend, and it gets sucked up and it gets blown out. Happens all the time in the industry. You know, well, you know, January 6th, uh, I think CNBC reported that and this was straight from the White House. You can you can look at look at this up. I mean, CNBC reported the White House says that they're going to cut premium cigar makers a break. Yep. What what it is, we don't know. We're all kind of antsy, and then we see. Um, oh my God, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, President Trump's attorney, the Italian guy Giuliani, right? Yes, uh, Rudy Giuliani. Yep. Rudy Giuliani. I mean, heck, he, t- uh, two weeks ago he was at Smokin' at their great bash. Yeah. I mean, he's now he's got a commercial where he's uh, promoting cigar aficionado. Yes. Yep. So I'm I'm kind of like yeah I really like what's going on I like what I'm seeing I like that we've got a politician who's who's close to our decision makers getting involved with our industry to kind of preserve and protect it and that's kind of what the BCA is all about you know even the podcast we create we created is called protecting the legacy and that's something that. You know, Armin and Carrie from Stogie Road Cigars have come together and they've, you know, we're just three crazy guys, man, trying to stay afloat. Seriously. It's, you know, I hear you. I hear you. You want to take some time to talk about your business? I mean, you've been on for about an hour. We never got to you and your business. I would love you to. Know, I'd love to talk well, a little, you, you know. It, it's <laughs> funny, man. Cafe1901.com. I, I, it, it is what it is. I mean, it is. <laughs> you're, you're, oh man, you're, you're. It's so funny. People ask me like, you know, Yo, you, you know, it's Story Geeks. So, yeah, just go to Story Geeks. Like, because you're confident. You're confident yeah. in your product. <laughs> you want my product? Go to my website. Like, you know, yeah. find a shop that does it. I don't know what to tell you. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> I, I, I respect that from a business perspective. Totally. Thank you very much. I, man. I do. Thank I you. do. Because I know you've been on other podcasts and you've yeah. talked about blends and there. And I know you've been on a couple shows and we talked about your medical background when it comes to premium cigars. And I, yeah. and I don't want to put that all through the wash and 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 and, and re. You know, those were well, their podcasts. Talk Cats. about that, though, because there's well, something so interesting about tobacco. Look, look for my business, right? We've got a factory in Honduras. We've got distribution offices in Miami now. <laughs> I'm the oddball in the industry, right? You, you certainly are. You're like, I don't want to talk about business. I just want to talk to you. I, I, no, but you know, the reason I say I'm I the oddball <laughs> is, you know, every, every, every damn cigar distributor in Miami has been robbed. Oh yeah, for you. wait, robbed I mean, physically look, from Miami or, or or no? Like, look, look. Let's go down the <laughs> list. And I, I, you know, my condolences to them. You know, can I Alan call Rubin. on your podcast and add to it? I, I we we could go on for days. We, well, <laughs> I mean, just uh, whatever you want. I don't give a shit. I mean, I, I just want to go down. <laughs> I just want to tell you why I'm the fucking oddball. All right, I got it. So, no, number, all right, all right. Everybody, be quiet. Number, go ahead. <laughs> I love Alan Rubin. My condol. I hope everybody got paid by the insurance companies. First of all, right. <laughs> Drew Estate. Uh, we had a company called Coots Cigars. We had uh, Adoa got his warehouse robbed like a week before IPCPR years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Coots Cigars. I mean, Fuente had a container go missing. Yeah. I mean, they picked up the container in Fort Lauderdale. Then as it's going across Alligator <laughs> Alley, it just vanishes, right? Like, poof. Poof. You know? Yeah. But so when I look at the eight, nine, ten companies, if you look at Casa Cuevas got robbed, if you look at um, Hochi Blanco uh, yeah. with Tabacalera Palma, their warehouse, I think last month got robbed or two months ago. Yep. Listen, man, I can't take a hit like that. So what I did was <laughs> I had a warehouse. I had a. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm sorry. I I, I apologize. Go ahead. So <laughs> I can't I can't take a hit like that. You know I, I'm. Every time I call a company to try to get insurance, they hang up the phone because everybody gets robbed, you know? So. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's awesome. By the way, so, Mark, when you're producing this, don't edit the laughter. I love it. <laughs> that's funny, man. There you go. Yeah, so, so what, what happens? So, so you call insurance. I, 
I had a warehouse maybe 10 miles from here, and I used to drive. And I used to share that warehouse with Ray's family cigars, right? Okay. And good family, man. I love them. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without them, period. That's a fact. And, um, uh, man, I'm driving an hour to get to work. Ten miles was taking me an hour. And to come home at night was another hour, you know? Yeah. And it got to a point where I'm sitting in my backyard one day, and I, we've got a large lot where, where I live, and I had this crazy idea of building a warehouse behind my house. What'd the wife say about that? <laughs> well, she was she was like, she was quiet, you know? And then what what sold the idea to her was that I told her, because we, we bought the land here, we built the house, Mediterranean-style house. It's, you know, it's a humble home, right? And... I said to her, look, here's my plans, right? And I called the architect that built our house. And I said, I want to build a warehouse behind our home. But here's the catches. It's going to look like a guest house. Mm. So so, so, it's funny. We've had people come over that uh, think there's a house behind our house. <laughs> like, they want to know who the hell lives there. You know? Can I sleep over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me. Everybody that comes here wants to sleep over in the in the office, you know. Mm. It, but it's pretty cool, you know. I've got mm. like two hundred and fifty thousand cigars in my backyard, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you're located in Miami. Yeah. You're you're physically located. Your your hacienda. Yeah. I use the word hacienda right. because it's a plantation now that you own a warehouse in there. Regardless, that's, of that's size. a nice name. I'm yeah. gonna start using that name. There you go, hacienda. I like that. Hashtag Stogie Geeks, right? <laughs> no. All right. So um, you you physically live in Miami, right? Or is it a That box? is correct. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. That's awesome. So I live in Miami. My commute to the office is amazing. It's Monday mornings. Fr- it's a minute. It's, it's 30, 30, 30 paces. I got fresh coffee. I got five <laughs> bathrooms in there. I've got a full kitchen. It's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, yeah. But no. also, I, I will tell you this. It, it's the reason behind our success, I think, our small success. Mm-hmm. Because what, what we've done is having offices so close to home, if, if I'm talking to my distributor in New Zealand, right, mm-hmm. it's, it's usually 12 o'clock midnight. And before, I was stuck in a warehouse in a shitty part of Kendall, you know? Yep. Now, you know, uh, if, if I get a message, I just you know, get dressed and come out to the office. And it's like, it's a 24 hour business. And that's what's taken our business. So people ask us like, so what countries are we in? Well, we distribute in 38 countries. Mm. And so Cafe 1901 has a following in the US. We're very brick and mortar heavy. But we also like to work with boutique cigar distributors all over the world. You know, and we're blessed because, you know, it's, it's, I've always felt that the strength of a company depends on the diversity of its customer base yep you can't put all your eggs in one basket you can't absolutely and and when the fda happened in 2016 was around the same time i started building this facility and then i took a whole international approach very serious and it's really paid off well you know uh, i think other countries have the pain in the ass with other countries is registering the brands and the warning labels okay but because no, they're all no different. other co- yeah, no other company in the world is looking to ban cigars. <laughs> right, right. You know? Right, yeah. Yeah, so even if the FDA does go down, this is another point you brought up. Even if the FDA does go totally rogue and, and negative, and, and uh, you guys still sell outside of the United States. So, I mean, you know, I mean, as long as you put on your American Express, it'll do the calculation yeah. conversion for you. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? People oh. forget that, you know, Hoya de Nicaragua uh, was the factory that has produced the only uh, cigar for the White House. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you knew that. Hoya de Nicaragua was the only cigar company that produced the... C- An official cigar for the White House back in the 70s. I did not know that. I thought yeah. I thought there were three, two others, but... I, um, I don't know the others. No, I but, just, you know, but but then again, you have to define, like, official for the world. Was, but the, the, was the, it for the, the White House or, or, or for the actual p- position of president? I, I For the White House, oh, not wow. the okay. president. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yep. Then you're, yeah. So what happened with Nicaragua was when the Sandinistas took over, you remember there was a block on Nicaragua. Hoya, the Nicaragua couldn't export to the U.S. for nearly a decade. For sure, yep. 
that's why you today you find their brands in 70 plus countries because for 10 years they have to figure out how to survive without the US. Plus if I can add that's probably why they did so well because those cigars been aging in a warehouse for 8 years as they could pass legislation to come over to the US, you know what I mean? They were yeah. already made so in other countries and eh, they were okay. Now they come to America and they're like, "Oh my god, these cigars are awesome." Of course they're awesome. They've been sitting in a warehouse for 8 years. Any cigar is awesome after it sits yeah, in a warehouse yeah. for 8 years, you know? Yeah, but but <laughs> you just got to adapt. That's what this industry is all about is adapt, don't mm -hmm. panic. You know, if you're freaking out, have a cigar, drink a scotch, relax. Yep. That's why we're in the business because it's it's something we enjoy. It's a pleasure for us. Right, right. You know, but but in a nutshell, man, it, it's been a fun, fun journey. If if I could go back in time and let's say I could buy back the seven years of my life, mm -hmm. would I do anything else? No. I, I, I Not only would I not do anything else, I wouldn't change anything because even the fuck-ups that I've had, even even the the difficulties with working with other factories, even with every single problem, has been a learning experience. Right. You know, pe people don't realize that. You know, you don't just design a cigar band, print the band, slap it on a cigar, and you've got a company. No, Some that's do. Not the way Wait it works. a minute. Some do. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, if you want to be candid, some do. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, that doesn't build a company. No. Nope. You'll 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 you know you'll take. A little bit of money and you might you know make a little bit of money but it doesn't really build a company where you know you'll get the attention of someone like you to have me on your show to talk about our journey you know yeah <clears throat> we well, so, don't want to talk about your journey you just talk about yeah I just go to my website and I want to talk <clears throat> about all this other stuff which I think is is, is, is it's excellent candor like it's awesome you know it's, it's just it, everything's out there you know we've invested into yeah. making sure the message gets out and we're boutique and We've really focused on producing permanent blends instead of, you know, hit and runs and short runs and and stuff that's only on the market for a season. Now, we're, we're blessed that, you know, yes, we produce permanent blends, but we still manage to be creative uh, with other companies when we produce cigars for them. So right, right now we're producing cigars for about 15 other companies. Mm-hmm. And that's what keeps things interesting, you know. When you got Amendola cigars, Stogie Road cigars, um, you've got brands like RTB, you've got uh, Alex Spencer Reserve up in Ohio. There's uh, brands in Europe that we're doing. Um, it, it just it, it keeps it interesting, you know. And recently, we've started working with Pravada Cigar Club. Brian Descend, he's an awesome guy, and he wants stuff that you know isn't available anywhere else, and that's stuff that we're able to give him. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, we produce our permanent cigars, our permanent lines. We never stop trying to make them better. But we do have about 20% of our business that focuses on, you know, trying to create new stuff and, and being a little bit edgy with some of the brains that we're doing. Right. But it keeps it fun, man. You can't do the same thing every day and expect to, you know, wake up excited. No, no. You have to, you have to, and, and, and you have to really, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a term in, in boxing or combat sports, or I'm sure the military. I never joined the military. My father wouldn't let me, even though he's a retired chief uh, okay. of, the, of the Navy. But there's a, there's a term. It's like you have to trust your stuff. You know what I mean? Like you, you have to trust what you've learned, yeah. what, what your experiences were up to this point, right, March 6, 2020, and whatever obstacle you are placed in front of, whatever obstacle is, in place in, is placed in front of you today, you trust your stuff. That you're going to make the right decision for the time. And that doesn't right. necessarily mean that six months from now, you would have made a different decision. It's what you've made at the time. We do it all the time. We got, we, we, you're going to leave this interview, and next time you drive, it might be tomorrow because you work where you live, right? But next time you get in a car and you drive, you're trusting your stuff. You're trusting that you have the ability to drive. And again, right. I know that's a different example, but it's the way the brain works, right? It's the way it's the way that that humans work, you know. And 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 the, you know, there's also a place where I think business-wise, and I could totally separate a list where you become internally centered versus externally centered when it comes to business, especially here in the premium cigar. So I'll keep it to, a, to the premium cigar, right? There are some that worry about what everybody else is doing. This one got bought out by this one. This one does this. This one's got a new plan. This one. Again, 
Go back and trust your stuff and become internally centered. Because if you spend all that energy yeah. learning about what somebody else does, you're not paying attention to your business. Right. And right. there's only so many hours in the day, in the week, year, however you want to divide it up. There's only so many hours that you can allocate to your project of your business. And, right. and, and it's amazing how I see that all the time in the industry. I can tell just by the way interviews go here. Right. You know what I mean? Well, we're small, but, you know, or they say, you know, we're small and we're proud, you know, or, yeah. or, or some of the bigger ones. Well, we've done this small batch and it's right. a Nicaraguan to... and, and it's a Nicaraguan Honduran blend, you know, yeah. ju just like those boutiques that are doing that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because right. and, and, they're searching for the market share. But like you said, since 2 percent of the U.S. population smokes premium tobacco, right, or just skimming 2 percent. There's enough room for everybody. There's enough yeah. room for growth. I mean, you know, if the world smoked premium cigars and chilled, I think it would be a much better place. You know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. but, but yeah. anyway, yeah. you know, it, it, it's just it's just I don't know. Like, you know, I, 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 I see a lot of that. And, and you I'm so happy that, you know, you are the founder of the Boutique Cigar Association because you. you bring that poise that I think is needed. And that yeah, mentorship. I, I appreciate that. You know, I really do. The mentorship. You know, I, 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 did, I founded it, and uh, two years into it, I wanted to hand the baton over. Who doesn't? I've worked on boards and nonprofits, and, and yeah, believe and, me. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, what, what's happened is that, you know, I got a lot of, uh, you know, the, the guys that were in the board just literally came back and said, you know, you, it, it's not that they don't want to do it. Is that I think that in my, my gut, that fire in my belly is, is what keeps it vibrant. Mm -hmm. And if I would love to find somebody else with that fire in their belly that is capable of running their business in, in the way that they do. But if you notice, I've kind of sucked in Armin and Carrie from Stuggy Road Cigars. Sure. And in creating the podcast, without them knowing, don't tell them, mm -hmm. I'm kind of <laughs> handing the burden off. You know, yeah. letting them be the voice of, of the Boutique Cigar Association because, you know, I can only do so much. And right. I think that we, we got it started, but to build it, we need a team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said, oh, you guys are crazy. You're going to go fly by night. This isn't going to work. Well, I'll tell you what. The purpose of the BCA was to lobby and to have our voice heard. And let me tell you something. We've never stopped doing that since day one. Right. right. You know, we've written multiple letters to both uh, commissioners of the FDA, and I think we got the message across. And uh, I, it, does my gut tell me boutiques? You know, when you talk about the FDA and cigars, you know we're we're going to wiggle our way to finding some common ground, so that we can continue to operate our businesses and not really be impacted by these regulations. Um, I do feel bad for you know the flavored cigars because many companies had legitimate portfolios you know you look at Gurkha with their cognac infused cigar mm -hmm. I don't think that's kind of a gimmick or, or that's targeting young people young people don't drink cognac right you know they're, they're targeting a mature crowd or the Java I mean I don't think the Java's a, a you know they're targeting 15 year old kids they're not doing that it's a fucking eight nine dollar cigar excuse my language no, no that's a... <laughs> but if you come out with somebody that's you know something flavored bubble gum or grape now we got a problem right get rid of that shit I don't care if they get rid of that shit right right you know, let's draw a fine line between what's adult, an adult product and then what's something that's designed to go after you know but the I also... introduction. But I also think like a cigar has the stigma of a celebratory experiment, uh, experiment, experience, yeah. right? And you know we've all seen it. I mean, I've done it with my high school graduation. It was the only time that we could walk the school halls with a premium cigar in our hand. Was the night of graduation, and we yeah. all got them, yeah. and we all we took a limo and did all of that stuff, and we went, we 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 wild out, you know, and we thought we were in a video, or we were on those rock videos or something like that. And but you know something, we we it it, it it it's a celebratory thing. But what would we go through, right? The most that entryway would be some of the flavor there. But again, uh, they're still gonna Gurkha is gonna be 
fine with their cognac yeah. dipped cigars across the pond or in other countries. They're going to be just I fine. Know, <clears throat> I don't know what, how long we've been going, but I'm on your time, just so you know, right? Well, we, 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 uh, Mock, do we have another five, ten minutes? Are you there? All right, cool. Well, we'll, we'll, All right. we'll do five, ten minutes. So right now, you know, H H R two three three nine passed this uh, the House of Representatives, right? And mm -hmm. everyone's you know bitching and moaning. I was celebrating because there was a clear premium cigar exemption. I didn't realize that in that premium cigar exemption, you know, no more accessories. You can't have yes. branded ashtrays, branded nope. lighters, cutters. You can't do events. You can't have like promotional things going on. It's gonna so be now, twelve dollars. You, 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 yeah, you catch yeah, that in the yeah. reading. So now an eight dollar cigar is gonna be twelve dollars in order to be qualified for that. So That's, it's, it's what's what's messed up is that you know I, I I see the premium cigar industry like you know we're like that dog sitting in the backyard just waiting for somebody to throw us a bone right now you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they threw us a bone, which was called HR 2339, and, and we picked it up and we're like, hey, fuck this. Right. And, and we threw it back at them. I yeah. mean, that's that's pretty ballsy, I think. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I you got to admire the spirit of the industry and never given up. Yeah. You know, now's the time when this thing's going to be defined. And, and yes, we got an exemption, but. We didn't get anything yet. Let's be clear. Um, the potential exemption is there, but there's some language. That, you, shit, man, twelve dollars. None of our cigars are twelve bucks. They're all between seven to nine. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's not like you're going to jack up the price and make more money. No, they're going to introduce a tax to collect the rest of that money. Right. It's not going to go to you um, there. But uh, I mean, who's to say that your second batch? Or your next blend under those rules, are not now you're gonna make it a twelve dollar or one cent cigar, like yeah, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But again, I think it's gonna it's it's gonna be dead in the water in the Senate. It passed through the House, sure. Yeah, it's well, gonna be well, dead in the water. It's gonna be dead in the water in the Senate. And, yeah, yeah, and the reason, I agree. And the reason, and again, like I I've been asking Drew Newman, who's a sponsor of this show, to come on the show there. And, um, you know, and, and, and like you get a chance to be in front of, of, of the boards or the committees and they're right. at the federal level and you're talking about jobs. Don't you understand? You're going, uh, and, and I've said this on an open mic forum and I hope that if I keep talking, it's bringing them to the microphone. Right. And. You talk about jobs, and I agree, and that's noble. I get it. Your family-run business, you got jobs. It, it, it's a staple in that right. town. I get that, sure, okay? But it's like you got to really, really define what a premium right. cigar is first. Like you had their attention, and, and, yeah. and, and you went with jobs. And I'm not putting all the onus on him. I'm just saying, like, you went with jobs. And, and I think – that if you went about it from a definition perspective first to define right. that and then realize that this is not the audience that you're looking for. You're not after kids like right. the cigarettes right. Right. or and, – and again, I'm not finger pointing at their industry either because I can make arguments to defend the vape industry. I can make arguments to defend the right. – the, the cigarette industry, you know what I mean? I don't like cigarettes. I don't smoke cigarettes. Can't stand them. It's like, oh, God, no, I would never smoke that, right? But again, mm -hmm. you, you can make an argument why someone would want to chill the fuck out and have a cigarette. I mean, you know what I mean? And God, we, since we all you know live in America and they protect our borders and we have God's right. gut, God gun and country, right? I mean, let them have a cigarette. Like, it's their, it, they, right. they're well aware of what could potentially happen. But I, I, I do want to finish on this note, which is really important, right? Because we talked, we touched Honduras, we touched the new U.S. embassy, the biggest State Department ever. They're building. Then we touched. I don't think we talked about this. The sanctions that were put on the Nicaraguan police yesterday oh, no. by the U.S. government. So what's what's happening is the, the U.S. has got a hard on for to bring stability to the region, right? And to eliminate corruption and trafficking of drugs and money laundering and all that stuff but you you can't bring stability to the region and at the same time decimate 250,000 jobs. Mm. So so it's it's 
I think we're in a good position. Um, at the end of the day, the title of that bill was, what was it, uh, uh, Preventing the uh, Tobacco Youth Epidemic or something? Yes. And, you know, look, we're not targeting youth. We've already established that. You know, so let, let's, you know, next conversation. Give us an exemption. Let's move on. Um, but you're right. The definition of premium cigar has finally been established. Right. But they've been on the floor for years now not Ten years yeah n- not making that the argument that should have been argument number 1 what is a premium cigar get it out of other tobacco products category move forward whatever decision you move forward you move forward but get Listen, a definition you know hands down i look i, I hate naming companies because i guess it, I, I don't want to seem like they're the enemy but in the premium cigar world when you have Imperial Brands that produces cigarettes, when you have Jay Cortez that bought Oliva Cigar Company, and they're the largest cigarette producer in Europe, when you have Altria mm. that bought Nat Sherman, right? When you when when all of a sudden, in the past 10 years, cigarette companies own premium cigar businesses. They're going to be brought into that category. It, it kind of fucked things up for guys <laughs> like me because, you know— <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're trying to say, hey, we're family owned, we're small, we don't really hurt anybody. But yet, the government looks at their portfolio. They have e cigs, they have Jewel, they have, you know, premium cigars, they have. So they clump it. it. It's so much easier for the government just to clump everybody together and just fucking put an X across, you know, their whole company. Right. Right now, look, the two enemies to the world now are petroleum and tobacco. Look at all petroleum stocks. They're in the gutter. They're in the gutter, you know? Oh, that's another hour talk. We could go in that some other time. But the point being is we're in a good place. We got to keep the fight alive and uh, nothing, man. Enjoy life. Take it easy. Cafe1901.com. It's all on there. <laughs> oh, you're wrapping the show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're wrapping the show up. Next week on Story Geeks, the host, yeah. Dr. Gabby Caffey. <laughs> If you want to be the host next week, that's cool. I can give you the, the portfolio. You can no, call the guest and do the booking, and then you just let me know when I need to show up. I do what I do, man. <laughs> I can't do your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, uh, my job's tough. You know, it's tough. No. It is. It is. <laughs> I don't envy your job. I get a lot of flack over here. And I, the, the, you know, I, I admire our conversation. For you Story Geeks listeners at home, you have to hear this conversation. I'm going to end it with this, right? Dr. Gabby says, oh, you're the host. Talk to me about your co-host. He's Armenian, right? And I'm like, no, nah, he's a Spanish dude from Texas. I'm talking about Drew. He was yeah. talking about Paul Azadori, and I'm like, he hasn't been on the show for two, for two years. Oh, my you God. Know, it's crazy. Yeah, but Paul said hi. I did tell him you were coming on the show Thank today. You. I did That's tell him great. you were coming on the show today. I did tell him that, you know, you 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 gave a hats off to him saying that, you know, he was original yeah. pioneer. With the Stoey Geek Show, it's and very and, cool. and I'll yeah. tell you, I'm I'm really having a blast coming here, uh, and uh, it it really led to some some super cool opportunities outside of Stoey Geeks for me, uh, as I'm now an employee of the Security Weekly umbrella, uh, here since then. So I'm in my second year of that, third year of Stoey Geeks, and uh, it's been cool. It's been it's been a super cool it's been a super cool ride for sure. You know, that's great, man. Um, for you, yeah. sto- for you, old school story geeks listeners who are still listening to me rant every week, I want to say thank you. But uh, I do ask Paul to, you know, he he is he he knows what's going on and and and, and he listens to the show. But uh, bandwidth is is a little sparse for him at the moment as he's doing other business stuff. So maybe that's he'll great. come back. He'll have a big comeback tour in twenty twenty one. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, I mean, it worked for rock groups, right? They take a couple of years off and then they come back on. So <laughs> well, they came back because they ran out of money. <laughs> well, Paul, uh, well, Paul, Paul, uh, it's not a money issue. It's a, it, it, yeah, it's, a it's a strict, it's a strictly bandwidth issue. You know, he's grown the, the other side of the business and uh, it's doing well. We we just went to San Francisco last week. Um, there we were at a cybersecurity conference and uh, super cool. You know, I think it's funny though. All kidding aside, he's like, yeah, you know. We we also do like a cigar podcast. I, I, I you know when, when he talks to the cybersecurity vendors, and I'm like, we? What do you mean we? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. But uh, 
I want to wish you well with the Protecting the Legacy podcast. For you, those of you, you who are listening and watching, check that out. Um, they do get a little bit more in depth as far as the legislation in the good fight that the Boutique yeah. Cigar Association is there. Uh, if you want to learn more about Dr. Gabby Caffey, you can go to um, Caffey, uh, cigars.com check them out maybe in a couple of months i'll get him back on the show and we'll talk a little bit about his blends who knows <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if not Listen, if not we'll talk more politics you know you know you I, I take the blending for granted because it's it's so much of what we do mm -hmm. that when, when i get an opportunity like this to to really you know this is a we're getting to know each other and I think a lot of people are intrigued with what's in my head, and sometimes it doesn't please everybody what I say, but it, it, it's the truth, you know? I stand behind it. Mm -hmm. there, there's a big mess right now all over the world, especially Central America, and slowly but surely it's going to get cleaned up, and our industry will be fine, and we will thrive once again. Absolutely, and I think it's super awesome that you painted a picture of what elements were important in the Nicaraguan boom that we always talk about when it comes to boutique cigars and why they went in there. And, and it's a fascinating interview. It's a fascinating perspective. And I want to thank you for your time for appearing on Stogie thank Geeks. You. Thank you so much. Truly an honor. And like I said, thanks to Armin for hooking us up. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate everything you guys do for the industry and for myself and for all the small guys out there. Thank you very much. Absolutely. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Stogie Geeks, remember, we keep the conversation going all week long. Go to stogiegeeks.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, all of that stuff. My email, joeh at stogiegeeks. Dot com. If you have any hate email, Drew at StogieGeeks.com. Behind every cigar, there's a story worth knowing. I want to encourage you to get out there and shop local. I want to thank J.C. Newman, Havana Cigar Club, Placentia Cigars, and McAuliffe Cigars. Story Geeks, we'll see you next week. Peace. <laughs>